one of the most important things that any law enforcement officer has to learn is how to talk to people. Nothing can get you in trouble quicker than your mouth, as we both well know. Everybody, you know, cops pop their mouths off and say something. And before you know it, you're in the sergeant's office, or it's the lieutenant's office, you know, having to explain yourself. And then you get I-8 and everything else. Or you say something stupid that comes and bites you in the ass later on. You've got to maintain, you've got to learn how to talk to people. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying kiss their ass, but you have to listen to them. If you're talking, you're not listening. Hey guys, don't forget to check out the Street Cop Training Conference April 23rd through the 28th, 2023 at the Gaylord Opryland Resort and Convention Center. It's going to be a great experience. Five career-changing days. Some of the most profound speakers in the industry. Guest speakers include Rob O'Neill, the guy who killed Bin Laden, Kyle Carpenter, the youngest living Congressional Medal of Honor winner, Fox News host Tommy Lahren, Navy SEAL American war hero Jason Redman, Sheriff David Clark, Sheriff Mark Lamb, and Sheriff Wayne Ivey. You'll also spend time with all of our Street Cop instructors at this event Monday through Friday. We'll have a great lineup of courses in addition to our great speakers. It will be a week that you will not forget. You'll be thankful you came. You don't want to miss out. Check out streetcop.com on how to register. If you're going to use the room code, make sure you book it from Sunday through Friday. That's what the code's good for, and it's about half the price of the regular rate. But those rooms are running out, so make sure you sign up now. We'll see you there. Hey guys, welcome to the Street Cop Training Podcast. I'm your host, founder and CEO of Street Cop Training. My name is Dennis Benino. I have with me today Gary Edgington returning for his second time because we just went real deep on the first time around a couple weeks ago and he was invited back because we had a great time. And it was a vet. Actually, I got a lot of compliments on that podcast, Gary. Like a lot of people were like, that was really fucking good. Thank you. I, I, my wife listened to it as well and was so impressed by your interviewing skills. She's a TV producer and she said, okay, this guy's good. This guy's good. Oh, shit. Yeah. Go. I'm not, just let her know I'm not really good at much. I'm <laughs> good at being a dad. I'm good at case law. I can interview people well, and I'm a fantastic lover. <laughs> Those are pretty important. <laughs> yeah, everything else I'm not good at. I'm just mediocre. <laughs> Uh, Gary, tell, I, you know, people haven't heard the episode before, just give us a little history of who you were, uh, who you are now and, uh, the book that you've written and we'll start deep diving into the book a little bit. Some of the cool shit you've done. Sure. Sure. Uh, I'm, uh, born and raised in, uh, Southern California uh, in Culver city. And, um, I started, uh, my, my journey in law enforcement in uh, 1974, when I became a police explorer with the Culver City Police Department, and a couple of years later, I became a cadet, which was a, a paid uh, employee. And um, my dad was in law enforcement, and uh, prior to that, he was in the Coast Guard for 20 years. He got out as a senior chief, and um, uh, in 1979, I was in the academy in the third week of the academy. And um, he was stabbed to death by uh, a crazy guy who shouldn't have been out on the street. Um, my dad was able to get one shot into him, but unfortunately that was not even close to breaking stride or rendering him uh, unable to continue the attack. And, and my father was, was uh, stabbed to death by this individual. And um, so, um, I continued my law enforcement career and, uh, moved on to Beverly Hills police department and, uh, had fun there and learned a lot and became a detective and sort of that changed my career trajectory because at that point in time, I realized that that's what I really enjoyed was investigative work, investigations, uh, search warrants and surveillances and interviews and all that fun stuff. And, uh, went to the DA's office and continued that full time for quite a while. And then, uh, worked major narcotics and uh, different fraud types of investigations. And then ultimately um, ended up at the California Department of Justice um, and worked uh, the Bureau of Narcotics Enforcement, major narcotics for a few years, and then transferred over to the Bureau of Investigation and did that for a while, worked counterterrorism starting in 1999 and with the Joint Terrorism Task Force in Los Angeles, worked organized crime, which is kind of a joke in L.A. It's not really serious organized crime. It's the Mickey Mouse Mafia out here in L.A. And then at least that's what they used to call it. 
and um, and then uh, uh, retired. Uh, well, be, uh, post 9-11, I stood up a, a counterterrorism task force for the Department of Justice, a multi-agency task force consisting of investigators from uh, uh, several agencies. And, uh, and then in 2008, I retired and took a contractor job in Iraq as an embedded advisor with the Army and did that for a while and redeployed home and um, then uh, sort of kind of started working on the book a little bit. At that point in time, I had an idea for a book while I was over there. And uh, then it uh, uh, started working on that and then took a job uh, as a as a um, an advisor and a subject matter expert investigator for the Office of Military Commissions and worked on the Guantanamo detainee cases. And then um, with the same company, I transferred back that that job was back east. And then ultimately, I was able to get back to L.A. and um, where my family was and um, took a job uh, assignment with that company as uh, the counterterrorism subject matter expert with an intelligence analyst for the Long Beach Police Department Office of Counterterrorism. And then uh, uh, did that for a few years and uh, then got hired uh, to be uh, a staff member at uh, U.S. Special Operations Command in Tampa, Florida, and did that for about six months and got tired of being away from home and came home and picked up this crazy gig that I've been doing now for about 10 years, chasing grease bandits. <clears throat> and uh, we now live in Charlotte, North Carolina. We escaped Los Angeles a couple of years ago and uh, we're loving life and we've got a grandson and we're, we're doing great. When are you going to actually do something with your life? You know, you know what? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I just can't sit still. <laughs> That's my problem. I can't sit still. <laughs> I mean, how many more agencies are left? Three that you didn't work for? <laughs> yeah. One or two anyway. <laughs> oh, my God. But I didn't go to the police academies. I can't say that. <laughs> I uh, often wonder why I, 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 what it meant in my life to have to go to three police academies. And, and, and again, believe me, I'm not the only person who went to three police academies. I know there's other guys out there. Matter of fact, my old partner went to three police academies as well. Shitty ones. Just, just as shitty as the ones I went to, to be quite honest with you. Oh, God. So let me ask you this. I mean, you got a lot of history in there mm -hmm. of the law enforcement work that you did. What are some of the bigger profile cases? And again, they don't have to be like nationally recognized, but maybe stuff that you did that you considered to be bigger and high profile or very interesting cases in the 16,000 years you've been a cop. <laughs> well, um, I worked uh, when I was at the DA's office. I had a um, actually there were a couple of narcotics cases that were pretty cool. Um, uh, when I was at the DA's office, I had a case, um, that started out with one pill and, um, it was, uh, a counterfeit sort of counterfeit, but real methoclone tablet. And, um, it was called Mandrax on the street and they were going for like 15, 10, 15 bucks a pill when I started out. And, um, that particular case, I just kept doing by bus you know, flipping the first person, rolling him into the second person, convincing that person to cooperate, flipping him into the next person, flipping him into the next person, flipping the next person, finally got to the source of supply for the drug. And it was a Mexican national uh, from a well-to-do family uh, uh, in Mexico. And he had uh, a girlfriend in, uh, in West LA. And uh, we got, we, we got, a, we, you know, we sat and we knew when the load was coming through uh, a confidential informant that I had flipped. And uh, and that was one of the things that I was I kind of prided myself on was patience and being able to flip people and get them to 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 rat their buddies out, uh, develop a rapport with them. I took my time with them. And with this this particular female, I was able to get her to cooperate finally. And um, and. Um, we had some of the coolest, some of the coolest surveillance photos I've ever seen of a delivery and an exit with a bag full of money that you've ever seen. They are textbook, you know, uh, you know, the bag full of pills and coming out 
with the envelope full of cash. It was like, I mean, there are just like fantastic photographs. And the coolest thing about that case was in the narcotics business, you know, you rarely, you rarely have an incident where you actually affect the price of drugs on the street. But in that particular instance, we actually did. We got the price of that pill up to 20, 25 bucks a pill from that case because we basically dried up the source of supply for a while. And that was pretty cool. I was pretty, pretty proud of that one. Um, and, um, you know, it was it was a fun case. We did a lot of we did a lot of, of, of buy busts on that case, which are always a lot of fun. You know, you know, you run in screaming and, you know, we're the police and you're not, you know, that kind of fun stuff, you know, and uh, and then sitting down with them and giving them a come to Jesus talk. And usually they did. <laughs> well, sure. I mean, you don't have many options, right? You're maybe sometimes staring down the pike of a significant well, you know what's interesting? Um, the problem is always, um, unless they've got a lawyer who's savvy, they bring in some some mope who, uh, you know, some lawyer who really doesn't understand how the game is played. Um, they can really screw up um, the future of their client, really screw them over because, you know, if they don't cooperate, then they're going down. And we give them a sweetheart deal. And, um, you know, if they do everything, cooperate, give us one or two or three cases, whatever the, the contract says, um, then they walk. And uh, but a lawyer comes in and he starts screwing around with it and, you know, strutting and, and making earning his money, he thinks or she thinks and totally screws the client up. Happens all the time. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, frequently it is the kiss of death when they bring a lawyer in, unless it's a good lawyer who understands how the game is played and really cares about their client. Um, they can really screw their client up big time. So. People get very confused on the difference between a law degree and somebody who's a competent attorney. Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's most of them. People don't realize this are fucking horrendous. Yeah. Horrendous. They don't really they just simply want to bloviate and and, you know, sound sound important and, you know, put their stamp on everything uh, and um, without really regard to the benefit of their own of their of their client. And uh, seen that so many times in my career, so many times. Well, it was a lack of humility, right? The bravado. And well, I'll give you an example of this. We had a attorney when I ran a real estate team, my friend, Dave Francis, he's excellent. Uh, shout out to Dave. He's, he's the man, you know, Dave always had a cool, common collected head when we talked about negotiations or people had complaints or there's something wrong with a house. And I would have oftentimes clients who are like, I don't think Dave's fighting strong enough for me. And I'm like, Hey, if you would like Dave to be a dick, you won't be in this house. Do you right. want to be in this house? And are like, yeah, I'm like, so just let him do his thing. There is going to be some give and take here. We are trying to negotiate. We are not in litigation at a war here. We're talking about five hundred to a thousand dollars in repairs. That, that, like, we'll let you know if we think it's something significant that we should argue about. But we don't really have to argue. We're here to negotiate. And some of the best attorneys that I have seen, outside of having put a show on during a trial, which I understand why that's done. Um, are intelligent, cool, calm, and collected, and don't let their emotions dictate. Right. But it's, it's certainly not their hubris either, right? Right. And people don't recognize that just because you went to school doesn't make you good at something. I mean, no. doctors there are that are fucking terrible. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, yeah, uh, that is – that's just the way things are. You know, I mean, people, they get that degree and they go running around and – uh they think they uh, they're now they now own the world and or that they're going to uh, impact the world in some way. And, you know, it's interesting. I don't know if you ever noticed this or not, but frequently some of the easiest lawyers I found to work with were the public defenders in, in many ways, because <clears throat> some of them were so tired of being lied to by their clients and that they basically were like, you know, <laughs> that you could just tell that they that they understood the situation and they they had a job to do and they did it correctly they didn't do anything that was 
you know, uh, not in the interest of their client, but they definitely understood the score. And I noticed that so many times versus brand new, fresh out of law school DAs who, God bless them, don't know shit. Um, you know, um, they're just getting their feet wet and um, they just have no clue. They just they come they're coming to the the, the world of, of criminal justice and law enforcement with 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 zero um, experience and world knowledge, you know. Uh, you know, they're, they're basically, they spent their lives in school. They have no understanding of what the real world is about. And, you know, they have these individuals come in there and blowing smoke up their skirts and they just don't see it coming versus the PDs are like, okay, I've heard this story before 5,000 times. I know my client's full of shit. You know, I've seen that many times. Oh yeah. And, and, and that coupled with a complete lack of humility. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 So you don't know, right? Just, just tell us, you don't know. You know what you're doing and we'll work with you. You know what I mean? I, guys always say to me, hey, uh, you know, we know what the law is, but our district attorneys, our prosecutors, they don't know what the law is. So what do I do when I do these things? They tell me I can't. And I say, you know, unfortunately, you're going to have to work with these people. So making them adversaries is not going to get you anywhere. No. And for some odd reason, these administrations from police departments like must listen to them. Uh, well, technically, yes, but we can certainly work together to try to educate and you're going to have to try to pre-educate these attorneys. Hey, here's a case. We intend on doing this. I mean, here's one that's so simple. Uh, people in this country, well, there's there's one right now that's hot in the top uh, in the topic of uh, of our groups and our social media stuff. And it ebbs and flows. Sometimes it's different things. In the past, it has been passengers detained on motor vehicle stops as instant to the lawful detention of the driver. You don't have to. You can't identify them. You can ask for identification typically. Uh, but they can't leave. And if they leave and you give them a command, it's a lawful order under the Fourth Amendment, the whole nine. That's, that's been one that's been interesting. Uh, that's another fun one that prosecutors have no idea what they're talking about on that one. But the most recent one is that we can't get lawful consent to search of anything, but namely on a motor vehicle stop, unless we conclude the stop, give them their documentation back, pretend, do a mock release to try to show voluntariness of a consent procedure that is not done under duress. Yeah, I know your, your face says it all. What the crazy thing is, thirty five percent of cops. It's it's known as a trooper two step. It's the quote unquote in the especially in the interdiction world. It's a trooper two step. Yet nobody has any documentation of where this comes from. We actually have documentation a case called Ohio v. Robinette, nineteen ninety four, I believe that says just the opposite. You don't have to do this to get a lawful consent uh, when reasonable suspicion exists to prolong the traffic stop or the detention. And to this day, you have people are just like. Well, that's not how we do it. No, no, I understand. You guys have been doing it all wrong. We we know that. That's why we're here to fucking fix shit for you. Yeah. And you know, like, well, our prosecutors want us to do this. I go, yeah, because it's been the same thing over and over again. Because that's what you think you have to do. Let's readdress this. And it's nice when I teach in a class and we have, you know, 150 cops and half of them are like, we don't fucking do that. And they're like, well, we do. They say we have to. I'm like, well, you're in the same state as them. How come they don't have to do it? But you do. Does that make any sense to you? You guys having suppression hearings and getting your stuff thrown out because the consent procedure was illegal? And they're like, no. And I'm like, so what are we doing, guys? Let's get to the root facts of it. All right. And unfortunately, when we talk about this lack of humility, when you confront somebody who's a prosecutor and say to them, where does this come from? One, they don't know. But in two, they just go, I'm a prosecutor. I'll make the rules. I'm a legal person. Blah, 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 blah. Why do you just deploy some humil humility and work with us, make our lives easy? And they won't, you know? Well, you talk to a judge. Uh, oh, I've been to several another classes. one. Yeah, no, well, but another. Here's an, yeah. Here's another interesting thing about judges when they look at a search warrant. Frequently, a, uh, I've been to many classes where judges have said, "Look, prosecutors have a tendency to want to try the case in the within the four corners of the search warrant, and that is unnecessary. A search warrant requires." simply a showing of probable cause and what you're looking for and all of that other stuff to satisfy the constitution. It doesn't require uh, you're trying the case. And frequently prosecutors have you put in everything in search warrants and can really make things way too complicated. And, and, and judges, uh, I've, been, I've talked to many judges that prosecutors want way too much in the search warrants, way too much. So hey, you only have a burden to meet of probable cause. You don't need proof beyond a reasonable doubt. People don't understand that. Exactly. Exactly.
And I try to prepare people for what they're walking into when they're new. Um, you've been set up for failure from day one. Let's face facts. And it's just basically on you to get unfailed. Right. You can't sit around and wait for these people to unfail you. They're not, you can't wait to be picked. You got to pick yourself. You got to go out. And we all, every instructor, be like, oh, it's easy for you to say you own the company that we got to pay to come take training. Hey, fuck face. Every instructor here, 40 plus instructors, this current time in the history of this company have all spent their own time and money and energy and effort and trial and error to try to get as good as we can possibly be. So we can talk on the subjects um, and collect our own little cavalcade of facts and say, here, this is what we know is what we've collected is our experiences. Here you go. I spend 30 hours a week working on this program, putting out content for you guys. And yeah, there's a VIG when you show up, you want to take it in person, press to share it with you. But also like this company too, we also share everything. We don't hold it hostage. Right. It's a different experience in church. You could watch church every morning at the, you know, on the weird channel that you, I think that channel is like, how did I end up on this channel? Right. Every morning, like, you know, when you turn the TV on, you're like, That's not how, yeah. how, do, how did I get to this one? <laughs> what is, what, what, who pressed the button? How are we here? Uh, you know, but it, if you like that kind of stuff, which is fine, watching it on TV and and experiencing it in real life are two very different things. I don't even like conferences that are remote. I don't like, I don't do live, like streamed conferences. I'll go, but I'll fly anywhere you want me to fly. If I think it's worth it, I'll rather be there and experience it. Cause I've, I've done both. I know there's a whole different world for them, but no, I agree. What were some of the major mistakes you saw in your career? Maybe early on, maybe ones that you've done regarding this job or investigations, what were some of the more profound mistakes or or constant mistakes that you saw people engaging in? And again, not in malicious manners, but just one of the big crutches or Achilles heel of law enforcement. Hey guys, if you're enjoying the Street Cop Podcast, do us a favor and go with, give us a review on iTunes or Spotify, wherever you're listening to us. Tell a friend. We don't charge anything for the episodes. We appreciate your support. Check us out on any social platform by putting into the search bar, Street Cop Training. Give us a follow. We have a lot of free content coming out every single day that you might not catch here on the podcast. And it's important for you to be able to do your job more professionally. And we also entertain you as well. Well, it all goes back to training. Um, and, um, I can, as soon as you said that, I immediately thought of myself as a baby detective at Beverly Hills. Nobody ever sat down with me and said, this is how you talk to a suspect in a custodial situation. This is how, you know, the reason why you're doing this is you want them to throw up all over themselves and confess and make your life a lot easier. So you can file the case and they plead out and everything, every, you move on and everything's great. Nobody ever did that. So I would go in and talk to these people as a baby detective and didn't know shit. Thought, okay, well, you know, I got a, a theatrics and dramatic and all of this other stupid shit that you see on television, which has no place in the real world. And then finally one day, um, one of our sergeants, uh, uh, his name is, uh, his, his call sign was Sam 12. He's very famous. Sam 12 had this had this class that he taught on how to interrogate people. And he was very good at it. And he was very patient. And he listened to their bullshit stories and their whining and their complaining and acted like he gave a shit. And that's what caused them to open up. And that's what caused them to start giving you the the opportunities to start whittling away and identifying the truth through all of the the, the nonsense. And so I would say that that was probably one of the things that that uh, in the beginning, I probably um, was really I, I just didn't know what the hell I was doing. And I was like that for several years before somebody finally said, hey, this is really how you do it. And I took those lessons to heart and, and carried them throughout my career. But I certainly had no. And when I was a patrol officer, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I didn't know. I could have been far more successful had been armed with with that advice and that knowledge when I was a patrol officer. Um, but I didn't really know, you know, because I watched what other guys did, you know, my my training officers and that kind of thing. And and so, you know. What are you going to do, right? I mean, one of the most important things that any law enforcement officer 
has to learn is how to talk to people. Nothing can get you in trouble quicker than your mouth, as we both well know. Everybody, you know, cops pop their mouths off and say something. And before you know it, you're in the sergeant's office, it's lieutenant's office, you know, having to explain yourself. And then you get I-8 and everything else. Or you say something stupid that comes and bites you in the ass later on. Uh, and you've got to you've got to maintain you've got to learn how to talk to people. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying kiss their ass, but you have to listen to them. If you're talking, you're not listening. And, um, you know, a lot of guys, myself included, I, I talk to too much instead of sitting there in dead silence. Because, you know, as we as we as you know, you know, if you sit there and don't say anything, they're going to want to say something because they can't stand the silence. And so, you know. Uh, it's just these simple little things, you know, that, that unfortunately nobody really taught you, you know, back then. I don't know if they do now, to be honest with you. Why was Sam 12 famous? Who was Sam 12? Oh my God. The guy was a detective for a million years. Uh, he's retired now and, uh, he was a character, an absolute character, a hell of a, a hell of a detective, solved a lot of cases. Uh, and, um, when I was a patrol officer, I'll tell you a story. Uh, I, I got a call of an assault victim at 509, uh, well, 509 North Palm in Beverly Hills. And it was about one or two o'clock in the morning. I just dropped off my partner who was writing a report. So I was by myself in the car. So I roll up to the, the scene, blackout, get out of the car. And, um, the, the, uh, the reporting person is standing framed in the doorway, screaming, hurry, hurry, come quick. Paul Lind's been assaulted. I think he's dead. Well, Paul Lind is a famous comedian back then. I don't know, you know, remember the show Hollywood Squares and all these other things. Bewitched. He was like Dr. Bomb. I don't know who he, he was like a character, recurring character on these things. A very flamboyant guy, very funny guy. Well, anyway. Uh, go in the house and uh, and uh, it was very strange, very surreal situation there and went into the bedroom, the master bedroom. And Paul Lynn was was dead uh, in an agonal position. He was, you know, naked and everything. And and Sam 12 was the sergeant that responded because it was a it was, a, you know, uh, potentially it, it, it required it required the sergeant, the detective sergeant to come out because. Um, we didn't know if it was a natural or, you know, something else. And, um, and that was really my first exposure to him. And he was, he knew what he was doing. He knew exactly what he was looking at. He saw some evidence on nightstand. He said, okay, I know what happened here. And that's what happened. And, um, it was, uh, it was, it was pretty interesting to watch. And, uh, and he was, he's just a, he was just a, a font of information and knowledge and uh old school an old school guy what was his personality like a really good guy a, a really really good good decent guy uh and uh you know not bombastic at all funny uh and um you know just a just a really good guy a good detective a really good detective what else was he known for if if he was was, this, was he famous in the Beverly Hills Police Department yes, or yes he was yes he was he he was really famous as an auto theft detective uh, it's where he really earned his his uh, his stripes he was he's a big car guy back then and um, he really knew the auto theft game and when I went to detectives I went into auto theft so he really helped me out a lot with auto theft because there's a lot of little nuances with vins and hidden vins and chop shops and all kinds of stuff. And, uh, and he helped me out a lot with that and, um, was, uh, was, you know, a, a mentor in, in that regard. Tell me about a little of the premise of your book. Uh, what do you talk about throughout the book? Why is it a good read for people to pick up? That's a good question. Um, basically, Outside the Wire is is a fictionalized uh, account of uh, a, uh, a retired LAPD um, detective lieutenant who worked uh, counterterrorism for a number of years. 
who's thrust into a war zone, Iraq, in 2008, who's never been in the service. So he's in a completely foreign environment where they speak a foreign language. And they have, at times, very odd and strange methodologies and procedures and, and ways of thinking that cause sort of a, a, uh, an interesting conflict between he, the, the, the Rick, the protagonist in the book, and who's, who's, who's basically a, a, a guy who's a mission-oriented casemaker kind of guy, the guy who, who is like, uh, you know, either you're going to follow me or lead me or get out of the way because I'm going to make this case happen. And uh, the bureaucracy and um, uh, the bad guys and everything else are all standing in Rick's way as he unravels this uh, this uh, multidimensional uh, conspiracy uh, with the help of a uh, an army physician um, by the name of Nancy Weaver, and um, it's a story of 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 a fish out of water, really, uh, a guy who uh, is just sort of an everyday guy. He's not a superhero guy who um, is thrust into an environment he really doesn't completely understand and uh, and how he makes do with uh, with what he has and uh, and sees the case through to the end. That's awesome. What motivates you to write the book? Well, I'll tell you, it's a funny story. Um, well, actually, it's not funny. It's actually really tragic is what it is. The genesis of the book really began one day when I was walking home from the chow hall, walking back to my my chew, my 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 room. And uh, I'd been talking to some other guys and heard that there had been another suicide on the base. And there had been like three suicides while I was there, young soldiers taking their lives. Wow. And uh, and there had also been an attempted fragging at another uh, forward operating base that fell within my area responsibility. The, the individual that worked for me at that facility, I had other individuals like myself that were embedded advisors, civilian law enforcement people like me. And that individual was one of the reports that that, you know, so I was aware of what was going on, what he was doing with it. And he was drawing on his law enforcement experience to help the military guys sort out what happened and investigate the case. And anyway, um, so I started thinking, well, this would be interesting. What if uh, a retired flatfoot like me was was asked to help out informally on a multi-victim homicide case, like an Agatha Christie kind of, you know, 10 little Indian sort of homicide situation. And so I started playing around with that idea a little bit. And then when I redeployed back to the United States, I started writing, started fiddling around with it. I thought, you know what? That's not really my thing. I'm not an Agatha Christie person. I'm a terrorism guy. Uh, so this is going to be a book about terrorism. And so that's that's how the story commenced from there. Uh, I've been a, I've I've been interested in terrorism since the mid 80s, since uh, since before the uh, the Olympics in 84. I've always been fascinated by it. And uh, so I, I, I used to tell people I was I was terrorism before terrorism was cool. <laughs> you know, you know, I got to see the pre 9-11 world and the post 9-11 world and contrast the two. And um, and so that's sort of what the book is about. I mean, it's about a, a, a big city cop um, that is trying to unravel a big case and uh, and doing it in a war zone. It's awesome. Where can they find the book? Uh, it's on uh, it's on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Uh, those are the two easiest places to find it. It's in a few bookshops, but primarily Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Do the audio book yet or what? No, I haven't. Um, I've been thinking about doing it, but I'm, uh, I'm more concerned about the marketing and promotion of this book and starting the sequel. There's been enough, there's been enough interest in demand, um, uh, from people who are interested in the story of of Rick and want more of Rick and his unique personality, um, that I decided that I I'm going to write another one, so I'm I'm going to start writing the sequel. 
So, so I guess that's what's next for Gary Edgington is going to be the sequel to Outside the Wire. Right, exactly. Is exactly. it going to be Inside the Wire? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I do have a title for it, a working title. It's called World Way. And uh, if you're from L.A., you'll know what word, World Way is. It's uh, it's where LAX is. Well, what else is on the itinerary as you carry through so swiftly in life, besides being a grandfather, an author, um, you know, literally having worked with 94% of the law enforcement in the country? <laughs> what else is left for you? What's the, what's the plans? <laughs> well, I'm taking up crochet. No, actually. Um, <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm learning fly fishing, and um, which I really enjoy. Uh, there's a lot of fly fishing opportunities out here in North Carolina, and it's, it's gorgeous country for it. And um, I'm, a, uh, a big, uh, I'm, I'm a big guy when it comes to shooting and, and hunting and fishing and that kind of thing. And I especially love really, really old guns. I spent a lot of time playing around with old guns like that beast up there on the wall behind me, a brown bess musket um so i enjoy tinkering with that stuff and i think that between all of those things and uh i also love history which goes along with my love of the old guns and there's lots of history where i'm at or out here and uh i've seen many many battlefields since i've been here and i continue to search them out uh whenever i go afield and so that's what i think is going to keep me pretty busy between uh my little buddy, Declan, and uh, and all these other little little uh, uh, diversions. I think I'll be a pretty busy guy. So it's awesome. Yeah. Well, listen, I uh, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast a second time. I'm sure we'll do this again in the future. Um, I don't mean to cut it short in any sense, but know. we have another fucking one lined up in about 15 minutes, and I'm going to start getting <laughs> yelled at. Yeah, then we just knock a fuck ton of these out a day because I'm a psychopath. <laughs> We just got a we just got a contract. I can't talk too much about it, but a hypothetical contract. And the guy said, "Well, I'd like to do four of these. It's a it's a very lucrative contract." Because I'd like to do four of your classes. Uh, you could do them back to back if you want. And I'm like, uh, you know, they're 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 taxing ten hour courses, and I got to travel in between throughout this larger state. He's like, you know, you could do them like four days in a row, and I'm like, fuck it, let's do it. Like, let's, let's just, just go. I'll, I'll, I'll try it out. You know what I mean? At the end of the four days and you know, people ask me, how do you, how do you do things like that? Just like you see the decision I just made, like, fuck it. Like, let's do it. Well, you like, know, what's the worst that could happen when the door opens, be ready and walk through, you know, man, I, I'm just, I'm just ready for a challenge. And yeah. it probably sounds ridiculous to somebody who may run an ultra marathon race of a hundred miles, mm -hmm. but I'm like, Oh, woe is me. I have to go teach in front of a hundred cops four times. Right. In a air conditioned room with water and coffee. People don't realize, like, honestly, as nuts as this sounds. Teaching large groups like that in the style that we teach with a lot of emotion, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of energy. Oh, it's fucking it. I honestly would. This may sound fucked up to say. I would probably think that some intensive yard work is easier than that. Um because I got to tell you, I've done intensive yard work. And at the end of the day, I'm like, all right, that was tiring, right? I'm a little, but I'm not, when I'm done teaching, I'm like, oh my God, I need a fucking bed. Yeah. I need my, I got to shut off. I need to like watch Discovery Channel and just veg out. And yeah. And that, so it's, it's very interesting. And a lot of our new instructors were like, dude, I'm exhausted. I'm like, yeah, I know. That's fucking, people don't realize it. Like when we teach the way that we do, it's exhausting. But man, it's, it's, it's awesome to have you here. And, and it's great seeing you again, man. I had such a wonderful time last time and this time. And me too. You know, too, all the best, my friend. I, I hope to see you again soon. <laughs> Guys, if you're in an area where you're trying to get to our classes, but we're not close to you, fret not. We actually have on demand training at streetcop.com. You can take that course online right now and then. You could attend that training in the future at no additional cost. You can redeem your voucher. So you get two for the price of one. We don't want to deny you the ability to take this training now, especially knowing that it can keep you safe at a very minimum, putting bad guys in jail where they belong, and at the maximum, going home to your family. Check out streetcop.com for that offer.